Welcome to Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. I'm your host, Russ Roberts of Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Our website is econtalk.org, where you can subscribe, comment on this podcast, and find links and other information related to today's conversation. You'll also find our archives where you can listen to every episode we've ever done going back to 2006. Our email address is mail at econtalk.org. We'd love to hear from you. Today is June 29th, 2016, and my guest is business strategist and author Ryan Holiday. His latest book is Ego is the Enemy, which is our topic for today. Ryan, welcome to Econ Talk. I'm so glad to be here. So why is ego our enemy? A lot of people, I think, would say it's our friend. And why would you write a book about it? I think ego, uh, to, I guess maybe to borrow a, a phrase from your book and to Adam Smith, is, is ego is not very lovely, right? It's, hmm. it's selfish. It's uh, competitive. It's uh, arrogant. It's uh, often delusional or unrealistic. So uh, again, I'm not talking, I'm talking ego in the colloquial sense, not ego in the Freudian sense, which frankly, I I don't even really understand. I'm, I'm, you know, the, the, the sort of grouping of traits that we might associate with say a Donald Trump or, um, uh, 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 a dictator or a a delusional celebrity, right? Um, I'm, I'm talking about in the way in which, um, ego ceases to be um, confidence and becomes uh, delusion and selfishness and, and all these negative things that, that ultimately are our enemy, not just because they're nasty and unpleasant to be around, but they make whatever we're trying to do harder. If, you, if you've lost connection to reality, it's hard for you to make things that people want to buy. It's hard for you to deliver a message in a way that people want to hear. It's, it makes it hard for you to do everything that's already pretty hard. And a challenge, of course, is as human beings, we all have egos, right? So yeah. it's hard to know. And I, I don't think you spend – well, you try. You talk about this not explicitly, but implicitly you talk a lot in the book about healthy self-worth and not just delusional but arrogance, overconfidence. It's hard to know because it's just it's – it's part of us. It's innate. It's yes. the – to some extent, it's just the fact that we care about ourselves and that's uh, a fact of life. What's wrong – with that, is there any is there any problem there? No, I don't. I don't think there's anything wrong with caring about yourself. I think what happens is when you lose that connection to other people, when you lose the when you become so obsessed with caring about yourself that you cease to be able to care about other people, for example, or you cease to be able to understand a universe in which that, that does not revolve around you, which, by the way, is is the reality, right? So. Um, I tend to find now, for you, uh, Ryan, maybe, but no, no. I, <laughs> th- th- there's a you know there's a quote from Marina uh, Abranovich where she's saying you know the the second you start to believe in your own greatness, that's the death of your creativity. That's because what makes creativity is is self awareness and humility and understanding of the human experience. You know, it's it's also that hunger to reach and 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 be. Uh, and, and reach inside and connect with other people. And so if ego is this sort of cloudy haze around us, it makes doing those essential things may, basically impossible. So I, I tend to find that it, ego ego can make success impossible, but sometimes successful egotistical people become successful because they're so extraordinary ta- extraordinarily talented. All the circumstances are right. But then ego or ego starts to undermine that success that we have, and then it leads to sort of self-implosion and self-destruction. We'll be talking about that throughout the conversation, but I, I first want to get want to ask you why you wrote this book. It, it's a, in many ways, a strange topic. Uh, there's a lot of books about following your passion. Uh, you can do it. Uh, oh, they really sell overconfidence as a yes. as a virtue, and certainly, you know, major religions of the world tend to encourage humility and uh, humbleness, but most business books don't. So, and there's more than a business book, but certainly there's a business part of it. Did did you, how'd you come to this topic and uh, what kind of reaction is it getting from people who, who are taught off in the opposite? My friend, Ben Kasnoka, he's talked about this a little bit. He's said, you know, what's ironic about the fact that business books are so encouraging and they tell you to take an initiative and that you're amazing and special and all these things is that by definition of picking up one of those books, 
you already know that about yourself. You already have that part of the motivation thing covered for at least for a large portion of readers. So I wanted to write a book that was very different. Like I say in the intro, like I hope when you leave this book, you think less of yourself. Um, and I mean, I mean that. Well, I want to buy that book. Yeah. yeah right? I realize there's somewhat of an antiviral element to that message, but I also think, you know, if you can leave this book less focused on yourself and more focused on the work and the people who might be receiving that work, I think you ultimately have a greater chance of, of impact and influence and success. So I, I tried to write a book that I felt like I needed in my own life. I'm not saying I wrote this from some person who's mastered uh, this, the, the magical state of egolessness. I'm saying, hey, you know, per, ambitious people struggle with the, the, the side effects of, of sort of toxic ego and what do we do about it? And that's where I wanted to come from, from it. And I also think as a writer, your job is to, is to not write the same book that everyone else is writing, but to write it something different and new. Can we talk about your ego? Sure. So you've had a lot of success. I don't know how old you are, but I know you're a lot younger than I am. <laughs> so, I'm sorry, I just turned 29. Okay. So you're, you're pretty young. I, I see a lot of my ability to be humble to the extent I'm able to be humble as coming from life's experiences. Mm-hmm. Of course, some people have can cram more life experiences into a short period of time than others. And you've had quite a bit of interesting experience, both business-wise and I think as an author. But how do you feel the book has, uh, let's just say the writing of the book, how has the writing of the book forced you or had an impact on your own self-esteem, your own self-awareness? I'm a big believer in writing books that force you to grow in the course of writing them. I, I think it would be boring to write about something that you know backwards and forwards. So, you know, in writing about ego, I'm wrestling with my own. And I mean, look, you see this in the process of doing a book. It's like, you know, you think a book is going to be about one thing and you think it'll be easy and you'll nail it. And, you know, the proposal is rejected. And then the draft of the, the, the next draft of that proposal is rejected. And then the third draft is barely accepted. And then you sit down to write, and obviously I'm not talking about this hypothetically, this is what happened, you know, that I sit down to write the book that I thought I sold and it wouldn't write. And so then I had to rethink the entire idea. And then you turn that draft into the publisher and, and all of a sudden they don't really like that. And so, you know, it's, it's they're writing a book is an inherently an, a humbling experience. And I've had many of those experiences in my life. The, the bigger the things you try to tackle, the more often you're going to crash into walls and rude awakenings that are going to, that you, you sort of have two options in terms of how you respond. You either ignore them and you pretend they don't exist or you face them and you sort of do that difficult personal work. Um, and hopefully you grow from it. And I, I'd like to think that I've tried to do the latter more than the former. And, and so for me writing this book about ego, it was not just an exercise in, you know, dissecting and looking at my own, but it, it really forced me to face a lot of things and, 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 and look at things. I mean, when I sat down and sold this book, I sold it in, in mid 2014, uh, or early 2014, um, I was the director of marketing and American apparel. And I, um, I, some, some stuff happened. And I was a, then a consultant to the board of directors during the turnaround. But when you watch a company that was once one of the hottest fashion brands in the world sort of implode and, and destroy itself as a result of, of the ego of the founder of the ego of a lot of the longtime employees of the hedge funds involved, you sort of, you, you also see you know, what, the, what the things I was going to try to write about historically look like in real life. And they're not, they're not pretty. But this book's, a, it's a big success. It's doing very well. Uh, I think it's, uh, last time I looked, it was either one time a week or so ago, it was about the number 100th book on Amazon, which is phenomenal. Uh, of course you can say to yourself, yeah, but there's 99 books selling better yes. than mine, but that's not your first thought. Your first thought right. is, I got this. I'm on top of the world. My next book's going to be even bigger. Right. How do you restrain and should you restrain those feelings? I think you should. Uh, I, I think it's important that you don't tell yourself a story. Uh, you know, Nassim Taleb talks about the narrative fallacy. I think what we can tend to do is we 
and Tyler Cowen has talked about this too. We we see our lives as this grand novel that's unfolding. And in novels, it tends to always work out for the person, right? We don't see that, hey, this is, you know, this is the high point and it's all actually all terrible from here. Um, not not that not that that's a good way to live either, but we we tend to look the stories we tell ourselves, I think, tend to be very optimistic and self-serving. And so like with my last book, it 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 had a lot of the same tracking signs and it did really well. But if I told myself that this book was guaranteed to do the same thing, I wouldn't have worked as hard, right? Like um, that. I think the reason, for instance, the sophomore slump exists is because people take for granted the success of the of the freshman album or the the freshman book or the the you know the the the, the first project, and they don't want to look at the the work that went into it. They don't want to look at the lucky breaks that they received. They don't want to look at the sort of key people who they owe a great deal of credit to for their success. And so taking those things for granted, they are rudely awakened when they don't, um, when they, when they, when they don't recreate themselves. And there's a, another um, quote I have in the book from Elizabeth Noel Newman, who she's saying, basically the only reason to look backwards at things is to find the mistakes not to, you know, tell yourself a story about how great you are. And so I try to do that with my books and with my past successes, but I'm definitely trying to do that right now because I have, I have no idea what could happen next week or, um, you know, some Malcolm Gladwell could write a takedown piece that destroys the entire, you know, that it destroys all the momentum. You, you don't know how stuff is going to go. And so I think the less you take for granted the more pleasantly surprised you're going to be as life unfolds. So you mentioned Tom Brady, the quarterback of the New England Patriots in the book. Yeah. As somebody who was drafted very late and had great success and actually use it, that example to talk about the, his team and how they, yeah. they learned from that experience. But let's talk about Brady uh, and athletes in general. Many athletes use the fact that they were drafted late uh, to motivate themselves through their whole career. Like they have a chip on their shoulder and I think they actually do have a chip on the show. I don't think it's a, uh, an illusion or a delusion. I think they actually are still troubled by the fact yeah. that when they were younger, they were not appreciated or thought to be very good. And I think about you. Okay, now you're two for two. Yeah. Uh, you know, the next one, let's say the next one's a hit. So the question is, is, is there anything wrong with just sort of saying I'm, I'm great? What's wrong with that? I mean, that seems like a good thing. It's, it might actually be true. Seems good. And, and I, I don't – I'm a little uncomfortable with the idea that you say, well, okay, I am great, but I'll pretend I'm not because that will be greater in the next book. Is that what you're suggesting? No, I, uh, I, I think certainly ha feeling like you have something to prove is a more productive philosophy than feeling like you're entitled to things. Now, which one goes to personal happiness and contentment better, I'm not sure, but I think – what what you want to try to do is is neither of those things, which is to live in the present moment to a certain degree. Like there's a quote that I love from Marcus Aurelius where he says um, to accept it without arrogance and to let it go with indifference. And to me, that's how I try to live about these things, which is, you know, when you're when you're on top, um, it's great and you should enjoy it but you're not letting it change who you are and you're not letting it warp what you're going to do in the future. And then when that 15 minutes is up or when things change, you, you understand that that is equally ephemeral as the success. I think that some people, it's not like, okay, when you're great, you should be depressed and find all the bad things in it. It's also that when things are bad, you realize that that it, the success doesn't say anything about you as a person and the the failure or the difficulty doesn't say anything about you as a person. What says something about you as a person it, are the decisions that you make day in and day out and the actions that you take, at least in my opinion. Yeah, I think most of us have a terrible time uh, taking that advice to heart. I think it's extremely difficult. Well, I, I, I'll, give, I'll give some of my own uh, personal examples in a minute, but I'm curious how you, uh, to the extent that you can, mm -hmm. take that advice to heart. So, you know, it's one thing, it's easy to say, and I, you know, this is a phenomenon that all self-help books have. Yes. You know, my book on Adam Smith has the same flavor as well. You know, Smith will say something like, uh, 
pursuit of money doesn't make you happy. Right. Maybe you ask people about that. Oh, of course. You know, it's not material things don't really satisfy our friendships, our values. These are what create lasting satisfaction. I think if you did a a survey, I assume maybe I'm wrong. I think a lot of people would agree with that, but they don't act that way. Uh, Mm -hmm. when, When push comes to shove and they have to make a moral or a career decision of family versus work, a lot of times work triumphs and they may regret it later. Or maybe they don't, but uh, a lot of us want to take these things into account. We want to be able to keep our success in perspective. And um, I'm curious, how do you in your own life uh, try to do that? It's very hard to do. Or do you just try to write books a lot so that <laughs> <laughs> it'd be embarrassing if you didn't? It's, it's, I, I actually do think that's a nice part about writing a book about stoicism and ego is that they're sort of public um, accountability uh, metrics, right? They're very clear, uh, flags that, that I could get called out on, but, you know, not, not to talk too much about my own book as though like sort of writing is the, uh, writing a book is the, the, the apotheosis of the human experience, but I'm going through something right now. And, you know, Nikki, uh, who's my editor and I believe your editor is probably Correct. listening. So I'll, I'll have to choose my words <laughs> carefully, but, um, so, so the book sold very well its first week, um, much better than I had even expected. Like the best that almost more than my previous book had sold in a month. So that's that's great. And then, as you know, with books, uh, a few days later after the sales are all tallied, the, the, the bestseller lists come sort of float your way, right? You see, hey, where did I show up on the New York Times bestseller list? Where did I show up on the Wall Street Journal bestseller list? And these are these are things that are nice honors, right? They certainly yeah. matter for your, uh, you know, ego and they're validating, but they also matter for your career, right? Like it's a, it's in a, a nice, it's not just a nice thing that has to go on your resume, but there's, there's quant, there's, they've done some studies about what this quantifiably does to one's earnings, for instance, as a speaker or as a writer. So anyway, so I get the first week sales and the numbers come back and I should have ranked very well on the New York times list. And I, I did not appear for reasons unknown. Um, and then on, on, on last search Friday, of, search of anger and frustration. Yes. <laughs> uh, and, and, then the then the the Wall Street Journal list comes in on Friday and I'm not on it at all. And I definitely should have been on that one. And it's much more of a meritocratic list. And um, looking at the numbers, I should I should have actually been number one. I would have been a number one Wall Street Journal bestseller for the the business list, which is a huge, a yeah. huge deal yeah. um, career wise. Again, like tried to. I, it's not something I need. I've already hit one of those lists. So I'm not like, oh, like, do they like me? But it's like, hey, if I get this, it, it, it's I'm not buying a boat, but it, it could be nice. Right. Yeah. Um, and obviously the fact that it wasn't there is an outrage. <laughs> yes. Well, and it, it, it wasn't Says your ego. Yes. And it, but it wasn't there because of a categorization issue, a decision that the publisher made about what category it should go in. Um, so so this is both crushing news and upsetting news and regretful news. And you have to like, you have to, th- this is, this is like, I, I think people think philosophy is what college professors talk about, but it's also, you know, at least for me, like this is where it comes in. This is, it, I can say, you know, accept it without arrogance, let it go with indifference, but then, then something happens and you have to decide, can you actually let this go? You know, like, you need to handle it from a business perspective. You need to try to fix this error. You need to find out who's responsible for this error. Maybe they need to be held accountable in some way. But, you know, am I going to let this... Uh, a day earlier, I was elated about the sales and I was pleased and I felt like I'd achieved some success to say nothing of the fact that I was proud of the book that I'd written. Sure. And now this this thing which I don't control, an external authority, has has, if I allow it to, has the power to, to take that happiness away from me. And so the, those are the moments for me that philosophy is so valuable and they are opportunities at the very least to try to practice that philosophy. And it's that internal dialogue of, I can sense you're getting upset. Is this really worth it? Is this going to make you feel better? Is this going to do anything about the problem? And, 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 and those are the, those are the moments where easier said than done meets well, are you going to try to do it? So let's say I'm, I've got this problem, which we all do, right, of uh, failing to accept uh, – did you say it was Marcus Aurelius? 
Yes. Okay, so I, I want to live like Marcus Aurelius, mm-hmm. and, and I tell myself that I'm going to live like Marcus Aurelius, but when I don't see my name in the list or my book in the list or my kid on the uh, roster yeah. or whatever I need to for my pride and self-satisfaction, uh, I don't get the raise, I don't get the promotion. Uh, I just, I can tell myself that, but often I can't act that way. I can say, sure. oh, well, that's sort of, there's sort of two levels for me. One is to remember, <laughs> to be yes. mindful of the idea of what you want to be, but often that's not enough. Do you agree or do you disagree? I, I absolutely agree. Um, like, look, uh, you could be the most stoic, self-controlled person, but if someone walks up to you and punches you in the face, you might have a sort of an immediate physical reaction. You're going to get an adrenaline dump. Correct. And maybe maybe you fight them back a little bit. But what you decide, what you probably do have the power, or hopefully you do, is now when that person's on the ground, are you going to kick them repeatedly? Right. Like you, you it's it's not about having a flawless, perfect reaction to everything. And I think trying to pretend that that's possible is silly. It's okay. At what point in the tantrum or the overreaction or the defensive posturing can I stop myself and get a hold of myself? Like there's another line from Marcus Aurelius where he's saying sort of when jarred unavoidably by circumstances, revert back to philosophy and to what you know. And I think what he's saying is like, look, your temper is going to get the best of you. Your fears are going to get the best of you, your emotions, your hormones, your all these things. But you know, just make sure it doesn't go too far. They're, I don't think the Stoics genuinely believe that you can you can quench yourself of sadness uh, when someone you love dies. But, you know, the choice whether you're going to be devastated by grief for the rest of your life, that is within your control. And that's where you can you can do work. And ideally, as you experience more and more things, you get better at it. Uh, They call it they call it philosophical exercises. And I think they mean that exercise sort of literally it's it's a muscle you're building. So I agree with part of that. I'm going to try a a different uh, reaction, though. So, uh, you know, I was watching uh, I was watching Chef, the movie last night. It's a great scene in that movie where the the chef confronts a, a food critic who's been criticizing him and he's screaming at him. And of course, it's being recorded and it goes viral, but he's screaming at him, you, you don't get to me. You don't bother me at all. <laughs> and there, you know, he's telling yeah. himself that, but he's failing miserably. And yes, and I think I think talk is cheap. I think it's incredibly difficult to avoid these kind of emotional reactions to especially to our ego and especially to issues of of letting go of control and, and expecting and demanding internally in our narrative about ourselves that we are in control. And when things don't go the way we want or expect, really having a hard time dealing with that. And I, I do think it's a matter of practice, but I think it's, I think it's with, if you don't have a, uh, a strategy, I think you fail. And I, 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 I can't tell you how many times I think we've all experienced this. We see a movie we listen to a lecture, we read a book, and it makes an impression. Mm-hmm. And we say, yeah, I want to X, be better, be a better father, be a better husband, be a better friend, be a better colleague, be less concerned about my ego. And we fail once that movie ends. <laughs> you know, once once sure. we put the book, your book down, I go back to being my, quote, true self. So, yeah, I, for me— now, there are two things for me that help me do this, and I don't – I'm not – again, it's it's hard to talk about this. That's not like you're bragging because yeah. uh, we all fail over and over again at this. Uh, but for me, what I try to do to help my own focus is I live a religious life, which I would never say to someone, oh, you should believe in God. That way you'll be more humble. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's that's not a – it's not a marketing technique, and it's not good advice. It's useless, uh, but but it does have an impact. But the second is is meditation and thinking about times when my own uh, set of issues comes up and meditating on the – having a focus and intention to react the way, say, you're talking uh, about trying to be uh, um, more indifferent to failure and not to overreact to, to success. 
And I find that it, I think, it's hard to know, right? I think it has yeah. some impact. Do you do anything like that? Yeah, I, I I like what you're saying. I think I think a lot of what we're talking about is not about what you're doing in the moment in the same way that sports, you know, it's it's partially what you're doing in the game, but it mostly has to do with the preparation because it's just the body reacting in these sort of split seconds. And so I I tend to... I tend to do a lot of thinking about what can go wrong in advance. So, you know, this bestseller list thing was not, this is not an outcome that I had wholly unconsidered, right? Or that was wholly unconsidered. I thought, I, I expected not to hit the New York Times list. I figured that the Wall Street journalist might not happen. It was, and, and in fact, the bitterest pill of it for me to swallow <laughs> Sorry is, for laughing. <laughs> no, no, no. It, Sometimes you have to laugh. Well, um, I think I'm laughing against an author who's never been on either one. So go ahead. Keep going. Yeah. <laughs> am am um, I bitter? Not at all. Go ahead. <laughs> but but the bitterest pill for me was is actually the part that I had not considered, which is that I might not hit it. Like not hitting it because of their capricious, arbitrary standards right. is one thing. To have not hit it because of an avoidable error yeah, yeah. that was Tough. that I didn't think about. That was the hardest part. So I think preparation, like the Stoics are big on negative visualizations or yep. thinking in advance what could go wrong. Not on the one hand, so you can prevent it. On the other hand, so you can just be personally aware. I have tried to, I, I have, I'm too, it's too hard for me to sit still to really meditate as much as I want. <laughs> um, but I've tried to, I've tried to incorporate uh-huh. sort of stillness and quiet more in my life uh, as I've gotten older. Like uh, I, I did this talk yesterday at a running store and I was joking um, that uh, we we have a, a pool at our house and I'll get in it with my wife and all I'll want to do is swim laps and she'll joke like, you know, it's being in the pool that is nice. Like you're just supposed to be in it. You don't have to like do anything. Accomplish, accomplish, check them yeah. off. Yeah. And, Seven and laps, s- eight yesterday, but nine today. <laughs> right, right. And so I've tried to, I, I'm trying to cultivate some of that stillness in my life, which I'm hoping helps me think a little bit more calmly and serenely that I can return to that stillness in situations that are, I think one of the things that, people forget is that oftentimes when things go bad, like this thing happens or some other thing, you would think it would be very painful, but depending on how you orient your life, it can actually be really exhilarating because you sort of go into crisis chaos mode. And there've been times in my life where I've really thrived on that chaos. And it's, you know, I'm caught, I'm just rolling calls on the phone and I'm sending emails and I'm plotting and scheming and, Instead of dealing with my feelings, I'm just sublimating them into a series of somewhat pointless activities. So, so that I'm trying to cultivate a little bit of not doing that in my life, so I can have a set point. Yeah, well, it's it's very challenging. I don't. Uh, yeah, it's sort of a a lifelong mission to try to restrain one's emotions, ego, sense of control, et cetera. Uh, in one sense, it's. You could argue, I don't know if this is fair or right, but you could argue it's in many ways the essence of growing up, mm-hmm. which is why it's interesting that you wrote this book at 29 uh, rather than, say, 59 or 79. It, 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 it's a book of an older person in general. So one could argue you do have a whole uh, lifetime to, to become a, a egotistical maniac <laughs> sure. uh, before then realizing that you forgot the lessons of your own book. But yes. um, hopefully it, not. Yeah, we hope not. Um but I do think it's a it's a fascinating challenge of, of behavior and in habit formation and just ex- success generally in life to implement the things that you want to implement. E- even you know the, the fact that you think something's a good idea. It's remarkable to me how little that has to do with whether you actually live your life that way. Yes. Uh, I guess maybe a way to put that is wanting is not nearly enough. Like the amount of people that you've met and I'm, I've definitely met that are like, oh, I want to write a book. And it's yeah. like, I want to do a lot of things. Yeah. Um, wanting is not what makes things real. It's the doing and the commitment to the doing that sort of separates the idea from uh, existence. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah, I want to I want to spend more time with my kids. Right. right. Well, what are you actually doing? Are you, yeah. What, what's stopping you? Um, <laughs> very, very yeah. challenging. Uh, why are you, to get back to the book, and I'm 
Yeah. Apologize for that long uh, behavioral um, uh, digression. Uh, you're very high on the Civil War General Sherman. Mm -hmm. Uh I don't know much about Sherman, and I, I, learned, I learned a little bit more about him from your book. I've never read a biography of him. I have a very negative uh, thought about him. My, you know, my Are general you from the South. Uh, sort of. I'm a kind of Southerner. I was born in Memphis, only lived there a year. Um, but you know, I think I, I'm pretty sure it's not my um, Southern roots. It's just that okay. the only thing I know about him is that he marched to the sea and burned his way through the. Through the South and uh, just destroyed a lot of stuff, and and he was successful. That's yes. all I know about. But you have a lot more to say. So, tell us why he's a person worth understanding. I, I'm I'm just generally fascinated by the Civil War. I think the, it's one of those things that seems very simple, and then you study it, and it becomes very complex, and then it becomes sort of simple again, and then it becomes infinitely complex again. So it's I, I've just gotten a lot of joy and fascination in studying the Civil War. And I, I like Sherman because he was sort of the least sure of himself of all the generals. Like if, if you compare him to General McClellan, um, they are polar opposites in every way. Like McClellan was born to be a general. He studied in France. He was like number one in his class at West Point. He wrote a book on, uh, you know, Napoleon. Like he was just, he was called the, the, the little Napoleon or the young Napoleon, I think was his nickname. But anyways, he, he was the man who was going to save the union. He was Lincoln's man. He was in charge of the, the army of the Potomac, which was, supposed to protect Washington. And he just repeatedly failed. He was utter failure, yeah. <laughs> utter failure in, in every single way to an absurd and managed to alienate and piss off every person who believed in him. Um, there's a story where Lincoln uh, was came to needed to meet with him. So he went to his house. McClellan wasn't home. And so Lincoln said, oh, I'll wait in the living room. And he sits in the living room and McClellan comes in, sees Lincoln in the living room, pretends not to see him, walks upstairs and goes to bed, <laughs> uh, which is just amazing. Like, like if he had actually been good, I wonder what America would have become because he, he, he may have actually been a Napoleon, a, a Napoleonic -esque figure in the sense that he, he, he might have usurped democracy and, and stuff like that. But anyways, Sherman was the opposite of that, right? Sherman's father died when he was young. He was adopted. Um, he did OK at West Point. Um, he missed the Mexican-American War, and then um, at, at, at he, he, he was given a subordinate command in the Civil War. And basically, no one thought he was really going to amount to anything. In fact, he was basically kicked out of the military for for his sort of scare monitor. He was convinced that the U.S. The US would need far more troops, that the war would be nasty and terrible and, and, and go on for years. He was basically dismissed as a crazy person. Mm. Um, so I like, you know, you read about a Napoleon or a McClellan and what they have is this sort of certainty. Like they believe in this destiny that they were meant for greatness. And then in some ways they achieve that greatness or they approach that greatness. Sherman was this person who was sort of crippled with self-doubt almost all of his life. And yet he accomplished more than almost any of those figures. And, and there's this wonderful quote I, I have from B.H. Liddell Hart, who is a brilliant military um, historian and strategist in, in Britain in World War One and World War Two, And he has this passage where he's talking about the difference between those type of people and how, in a weird way, accomplishments much accomplishment must be so much sweeter to someone like Sherman because he never thought it was his by birth, that he was he was actually experiencing it as it was happening. Um, and, and, and so I was fascinated by that. And then, of course, as a as a strategist, I talk about him a little bit in, in, in The Obstacles Away. He basically realized that the entire concept of a large army attacking another large army was just a recipe for pointlessly killing a lot of people. And his march to the sea was was in many ways a repeated evasion mm -hmm. of uh, pitched battles against uh, the Confederate army. And, and he destroyed a good portion of the South, but not indiscriminately. He did not have it was not total war by any sense. What he said he was doing, he was bringing the hard hand of war to the South. And what that meant is um, the, the, the original Northern approach was, hey, if we just wait this thing out, the South will eventually give in. 
And, you know, a lot of, weirdly, a lot of the battles in the Civil War are in the North, which makes no sense, right? Because the South was trying to leave the United States. And Sherman realized, hey, this war is only been able to to continue because the Southern people have not felt any of the consequences of supporting secession. And I'm going to bring that war to them and I'm going to make them relent. And that's basically what his march to the sea did. It crushed the 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 the, the economic viability of the South, um, which, by the way, he predicted from day one in the war was the only way to win it. And he did that. He also was brilliant enough to understand that it wasn't until the, the North took a number of major U.S. Uh, sorry, major southern cities back that it that Lincoln would be able to win the reelection. So that's, you know, um, that that was a critical another point in American history. So think, I just find him to be a fascinating figure. But do you think his humility is an important part of his success or do you think it's just that he had the blessing of not being having a sort of military silver spoon and of expectations uh, that, that made him more just having think- to make him more humble? I think it's both. But what I think is so interesting, I talk about this in the book, is after the Civil War, um, Sherman famously, basically the the presidency was offered to him. And he he gave his famous Sherman-esque statement. He said, you know, if if nominated, I will not run. If elected, I will not serve. Basically, leave me alone. I've done my – he said, I have all the rank that I want. So I'm so fascinated of of all the Civil War generals. Basically, he retired – he, he served a little bit more. He fought in the Indian Wars, and then he um, he basically retired to New York City, and he he watched Broadway plays for the rest of his life. Like he My seemed to have, he seemed to have <laughs> have lived a somewhat satisfying life, and and the success did not ruin him in the way that you know Grant was was pushed towards the presidency, which was disastrous, and yeah. then he was pushed towards Wall Street, which is disastrous. So I I, I just find him as a, a an interesting model, and I think it's it's. Un, it's unfortunate that more people don't know about him and, and look to him in that way. So let's take a, the flip side um, of that character trait mm-hmm. uh, and let's look at Winston Churchill. Yes. So I'm, Winston Churchill, he could talk about in the book, but mm-hmm. um, he was – he had, it appears, an enormous ego. Yes. That sustained him through all kinds of failure. Uh, you know, he was – he was blamed uh, for for the uh, – some of the disease. Yep, Gallipoli in the First World War. In World War II, in the run-up to World War II, he's considered a crazy lunatic who's worried sure. about Nazi Germany. And ultimately, he's uh, – of course, his reputation is is redeemed and he's considered a, one of the greatest figures of the 20th century. Yes. Like top five. So his ego – and by the way, his um, – one of my, you, you quote, I think, the, um, the Manchester biography, uh, yes. volume two alone. Well, in volume one, one of, the, one of the moments that's legendary in my household because my kids loved it so much, you know, he escapes from a prison in the Boer War, walks, yeah. walks a huge distance, I forget how far, and presents himself in the middle of the night at the British Embassy and, and pounds on the door and someone opens a window upstairs and says, what's going on? And he, he yells up something like, it's Winston bloody Churchill, open this door. And so here's a man who's totally full of himself, mm-hmm. as far as I can tell, and he's a great success. So well, why is he go the enemy? I, I'm fascinated that you would ask this because uh, – and, and- – for listeners, we did not plan this. I'm actually in. I'm. I just. I have like ten pages left in volume <laughs> two. I've been and I. I read volume one in the last couple of weeks. So I've been. I've been reading about Churchill, uh, and I, he's fascinating. And the Manchester biography is so great because oh, tremendous he, book. <laughs> he looks at that ego, and you know, he says over and over again. You know, basically Hitler and Churchill were sort of, you know, opposite sides of the same coin, and that he, he says, you know, it's interesting. The, maybe the only reason that Churchill saw through Hitler was that he saw a bit of that megalomania yeah. in himself. And so yeah, sure. I've, been, I've been very interested in that. I think um, I, I, I'm not saying that egotistical people never become successful. But in Churchill's case, yes, his ego fueled his ambition, especially early on and got him ahead. But, you know, not all of the things that happened to him were uh, were. Was he wholly without blame for right? So oh, part of 
part of his exile or, you know, his his middle period where he is alone is not just the result of, you know, Neville Chamberlain being uh, delusional about peace in our time. A lot of it had to do with the fact that Winston Churchill was without allies and managed to alienate and hurt the feelings of pretty much every single person yep. that needed um that 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 he needed their support, and you know, you're reading. It's like his wife is like, you know, basically, like, Winnie, don't do this. Like, this is not a hill to die on. And he's like, I have to defend the king's right to, you know, have an affair and you know, marry a commoner. And and he he basically like, or you know, he he got bogged down in in the in the the fight about you know independence for India, and. You know, and the Gallipoli campaign was a, a, a stroke of strategic insight, but then sort of Churchill kind of figured that just having the strategic insight was enough, actually executing on that idea and managing it was something he wasn't quite as good at. And so what's so fascinating about Churchill is he was this immensely creative, innovative, brilliant guy. But the problem was he believed in all of his ideas equally well, with equal certainty. Correct. He had a tank for the landing that was a total failure. I can't remember any of the yes. details about a landing craft. Uh, yeah. that he, he made he made a zillion mistakes, right? Right. And, and we also have to add uh, his history of the Second World War, which is a phenomenal uh, – I think it's six volumes, five or six volumes, uh, which I recommend. Okay. It's, of course, marred by the fact that – it's all about him, <laughs> sure. or, or, or you know, it's it's like uh, it's like the uh, the chapter in Nietzsche. I think it's an Eke Homo. He's, you know, it's why I am so smart. That could have been the title of of the book. So he's a man who who has a tremendous ego, uh, and yes, he could have. Uh, I'll accept the point that he could have been more successful. He'd been a little bit more self aware, um, but maybe not. You know, well, it, it's it's interesting because I was just reading that one of the reasons that the cabinet was so reluctant to have Churchill be involved in some of the pivotal negotiations and discussions before Churchill came back to power. One of the, one of the, they were afraid the, of him. They, you know, well, and, and <laughs> Neville Chamber says, Neville Chamberlain actually says, Oh, he's just basically here to write another book. That's yeah. what they thought he was trying to do. And so in, in it, it's not that he could have been more successful. It's that, that, the ego that propelled him to greatness was also could have equally destroyed him at any moment. And in fact, I would say Western civilization is lucky that Winston Churchill had his ego in check just enough that he never fully imploded or took his ball and went home or yeah, so did something so foolish that, you know, that he uh, that he, he he ruined his chance of ever coming back. Well, and you talk about this, how, you know, we only see the successes. We don't know how many egomaniacs failed because they couldn't yeah. restrain their ego. And I think, you know, for me, Steve Jobs is another example where, and you Absolutely. talk about him where, you know, Walter Isaacson's book portrays him, I th it appears honestly, as, a, mm -hmm. as an incredible egomaniac. And I think a lot of people misread that to say, and look how well it served him because sure. he's a great success. But I, I see someone who came this close to being a totally ignored figure in American business history. That's exactly right. Um, so talk about that. Well, I, that's right. We we the fact that he came back to Apple obscures how unusual and unlikely that yeah. is. Nobody gets a second chance like that. Um, I think that's interesting. And then I, I'm also I, I'm fascinated by just the sheer pointlessness of it. Right. So like he was famous for parking in handicap spaces in front of Apple. Right. Yeah. Um, and I just, you know, if you think, yeah, if, if you think, right, <laughs> really? it's like, so you could have redesigned the entire headquarters. So you had a parking spot in the front. You're a billionaire. You could have uh, paid for someone to park your car for you. You could have had a valet, you know, you could have uh, walked right 10 feet. So, so in, in some ways it, it's, it's this dark personality flaw. I, I imagine he he probably perversely in. It's not that he just did it and he didn't realize it. I get the sense that he probably perversely enjoyed that. No, I think uh, that's that's exactly right. I think that's the the most destructive part of ego run amok, which is it's not just that it limits your ability to have people work with you or whatever, but it it corrodes your soul, which he yes. makes it much harder for people to work with you because. You revel in the fact that you're important and they're not, and there's just um, just a horrifying uh, human temptation that 
that it is we talked about before. I think it's it's kind of challenging to have, to avoid because it feels good. Have, right? have you read um, Robert Caro's series on Lyndon Johnson? Funny you mention that. I was just thinking about that as we we're talking about your show because <laughs> that book um, to me is the, is the greatest single portrait of human ambition mm-hmm. and the urge for power. And uh, it's one of the great achievements as a, you know, as a, as a of portrait. all of Western literature, yeah, I would no, say I think it's, it's stupendous. It's a top, top 10 book ever. Uh, and it's still going uh, incredibly. Yes. Um, but yeah, there's a book where, especially volume one, uh, you see the naked uh, arrogance of Johnson on display. And I guess you know, one thing we haven't talked about, and I don't, I'm not, not sure you talk about it much in the book, is how often people who are egotistical on the outside are fundamentally insecure. Yes. Which uh, I think people find, quote, surprising. I don't, it's not surprising to me at all. It's clearly a defense mechanism, a shield. I see it in my own self. Uh, I think part of the, the thrill of getting a little more humble as you get older is realizing, being able to see yourself honestly and what you were like when you were younger. And it's, it's not pretty. Well, one one of the things that Carl says in the book that I like is he's saying, you know, it's not that power corrupts, it's that power also reveals. Yeah. And I think that's what you see with someone like Steve Jobs is that as he became more powerful, he, he wasn't becoming better. He was becoming worse, um, even even as he was becoming more and more talented and creatively brilliant. He was becoming in some ways personally more repugnant. But what's so fascinating to me about Johnson, yeah, is that he was immensely insecure. And then it all sort of came down to this, the failure of his father and the, the struggles that that family had. Uh, the, the revealing scene to me was that there, uh, Carl talks about this in college, you know, um, Johnson had this reputation of sort of bullying everyone. He would call you out. He would stick his finger in your chest. And there was some poker game uh, where somebody finally had enough and they stood up to fight uh, Johnson. And Johnson sort of threw himself on a bed and stuck his, he starts kicking his legs around. And uh, Carl says, basically like a girl and saying, you know, if you come at me, I'm going to kick you. If you come at me, I'm going to kick you. And so you realize just sort of how, how fragile the edifice can be. And I think, you know, it's fascinating. Donald Trump is talking about ego and, and, you know, he says every successful person has a big ego and, you know, America is being out egotized. And then this guy can't not respond to random trolls on Twitter as though that's a sign of strength and reality. You know, I, I talk about that story in, in between An- Angela Merkel and Vladimir Putin in the book where, Putin attempts to intimidate her uh, by by letting a, a dog run into the room that he knows she's afraid of. And and for her, that what I admire is her not rising to that bait and resisting and, and sort of enduring a tiny bit of immediate discomfort for a larger goal. To me, that's bravery and strength. And that's where confidence comes from, not from, uh, hey, I'm going to say something mean about this person on the Internet when I get back to my phone. Yeah, and I think that's that's the um, the challenge of really the your ego in everyday life, the petty humiliations that life inevitably delivers to all of us, um, and how you accept them, react to them. And there's a a story I wanted to mention. It's a good time to mention it. It's uh, it's by Isaac Bashev, a singer. It's called Gimple the Fool. It's one of my favorite short stories, and it's it's remarkably uh, provocative and deep. At least, if you think about it, on the surface, it's very straightforward. It's about a, it's about Gimple, whose whose wife betrays him, whose friends deceive him. Everything in his life is 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 horrifying. He's a sucker. He's a victim over and over and over again, and he he just reacts with um, he misreads all of it, and that's why he's Gimple the fool. But the title is fundamentally um, ironic, I think. Sure. In terms of how we deal with with betrayal, how we deal with um, those petty humiliations, his are not petty, but that's what makes it more powerful a more powerful story. And when that person uh, mocks us on the internet, actually, let's let's turn to that because I wanted to ask you. Yeah. So, uh, you, you know, Adam Smith talks about the quackish arts of self promotion mm-hmm. uh, and how you should avoid them. And in our time, they're everywhere. So you mentioned, you know, Twitter. Facebook, um, 
how do you deal with that? What is both on the positive and negative? I think it's very hard not to get excited when you get a follower or a friend yes. or a, a retweet and you're, you become a little bit addicted to that uh, adrenaline rush or dopamine. I guess it's dopamine. That's exactly what it is. I mean, I'm ashamed of the days that I've lost in my life yeah. <laughs> where something has gone really well. Like I've written an article and it's sort of blown up online or, you know, I got some decent media placement and I just spent hours sort of refreshing and looking and, <laughs> sure. you know, like it, it, you're, sur- you're basically just high is what you are and, and you're just enjoying it. And so I, I'm- You're just a I, rat. You're just yeah. a rat hitting that buzzer, getting that cheese over and over. Oh, another piece of cheese. <laughs> and it's silly to think, you know, wait, something good happened. And so it's costing me, like, I'm not able to work today because something good happened. It's absurd. Um, on the other side of that, one of the things I've realized is like, occasionally, you know, from time to time, especially when I was working more for companies, you'll have unpleasant email exchanges with someone, right? They've done something wrong. They think you've done something wrong and you're arguing. And I, I remember I was in some argument with someone and, and, I, it stopped all of a sudden and I couldn't figure out why. And I found out a couple of like weeks later that I'd, I'd either accidentally marked the email as read or my, you know, my inbox had, had eaten it. And so like that nasty thing that I then found and was made upset by, I'd narrowly missed being upset by. Right. And so I just realized like when, when I choose get the, to do that. Yeah, when I get the sense that someone is just trying to get the last word, I don't consent to that. I just go, oh, I'm not going to open this. I'm just going to pretend that I didn't receive it. And that has saved me so much unnecessary pain slash uh, anger towards someone. And then it dies off and usually you're fine talking to that person again. You have to rise to the next level. You have to rise to the next level and say, I'm going to give you the last word. It's yeah. okay. It's really okay. It's okay. You know, I love it when, I, when I'll say something on Twitter and uh, someone will challenge me back and ask me a question and I forget about it. I don't respond. And this happened to me yesterday. Somebody writes me like six months or a year after a previous Twitter. She says, <laughs> you never answer my question. You, know, you don't have an answer. Right. Huh? Huh? And I'm thinking, do you really think that's the only reason I might not? But they do. And um I'm going to enjoy the fact that I'm not going to play that game. I think it's a, it's a, it's a, um, I don't know if I'm, it's a form of self deception, the good kind maybe. Yeah. Uh, to say, I'm not going to play that game. I don't have to play that game. I can just watch it and observe it and, and be above it. I'm not going to play. I, I wish there was an, and this is going to sound a little egotistical, but I wish there was an acronym that I could use that basically, I was talking, to someone about this the other day, that it would it would basically be like not enough followers to respond. And that like, <laughs> so when someone with seven followers says like, you know, you're worthless, yeah, I hate your books, you. Your book's uh, garbage, yeah. Yeah, I would just be able to say like, hey, I saw that you said this, but um, not responding. You know what I mean? So yeah, they don't think the, I'm, a, you know? Yeah, no, exactly. Because if you don't respond, they, they get a moral victory. Yeah, yes. but again, I think you go to the next level. You say, right. "It's great. I'm going to give them that moral victory." They're pitiful. They're mm-hmm. so their life is so empty that they have to get a thrill from insulting me, right? Yeah. So I'm going to say, "I feel sorry for him," and I do. I'm, I, I don't think this yeah. is. A, I, I don't want to suggest this is some uh, again some little formula that you should tell yourself. I think you should actually think that's sad. Uh, you don't. You don't have to respond to it and. Let them have that. Even even let them have that moment of glory if they think they've made a fool of you or it's really okay. Uh, I, what I find fascinating is how viscerally I sometimes want to respond. And uh, I, I've tried to remake, and I, you know, I don't know if this works or if it's a good idea, but I've tried to remake my reward function to be more about um, enjoying not responding, which is, you know, it took a long time. One of the responses I found that works decently well uh, especially because the, these things can be a little contagious. So it's not, you know, it, all of us, if you don't respond to this thing enough times, it can start to take on a, a an appearance of truth. Like let's say it's some rumor. Or, right. But, sure. uh, I'll, I'll just say like, I hope this makes you feel better. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it, that usually sort of puts it in its proper place, which is this has really nothing to do with nothing me do with and me. everything to nothing do with to, you. Yeah. So here's a related example, um, which you talk about in the book, which is, you know, the challenge of admitting 
uh, that you don't know something. And sure, uh, it took me forever to be able to say I don't know and enjoy it. So you know, most of my life, I want to talk about that in in how Adam Smith changed yeah. change your life. But uh, just it's so important. Uh, first of all, the temptation to lie. Like you asked me if I if I knew the Caro book. Well, now I have yeah. to have read. What I didn't reveal is that I'm a huge booster of that book to my friends, but I've not read volume three in its entirety. I kind of bogged down, right? But when you asked me, I didn't say, well, you know, I've read, I've read two of the vo-. You didn't ask me, right. literally. You said, sure. have you heard of it? And I, said, I answered, was the truth. But I don't like to say that. I want, to, I want to, people to think, oh, wow, he's read all four volumes. Right. And I haven't. I've only read two. And to say I haven't hurts. Which yes. is pitiful. I mean, it's such a trivial, stupid right, thing. Right. But you know, when we talk about self awareness, I think the. I don't know whether it's the way I grew up. I don't know whether it's my genetics. I don't know whether it was parenting by my parents. It took me a very long time to say I don't know, and I know people who don't have that problem. Uh, they can say it, and they seem comfortable. For me, it took a long time to be able to say it, and it's taken a much longer time to actually kind of enjoy it. It's okay. It's not just okay. It's like. It's, it's liberating to say it. It's great. You don't have to know everything. Uh, I've found, I think for me, what helped sway me in that regard, and I'm not very good at it, but it, it's like I went out to dinner with this uh, or lunch with a very important person. And, and I realized after I left that I talked the entire time when really I should have been learning from this person. And I realized that was sort of a nasty habit but of they mine. they were and, so impressed, Ryan, with those brilliant things you <laughs> totally. had to say that it turned out to be a wonderful decision on your part, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah, and, and look, and this guy had said I'd asked him some questions, and he'd re, he'd always he'd responded I don't know many times, <laughs> and I realized that I realized that whatever the perception was, the real sort of power differential was in was in the the fact that he was comfortable not talking, and I was only comfortable if I was talking, and so in fact saying I don't know or you know not answering or not talking is not weakness; it's the opposite of weakness if you do it right, you know, and. And so that's that's sort of seeing that. And there's other people I admire, like um, if you if you've ever checked out Tim Ferriss's podcast, sure. he like people will say things and he'll be like, wait, what is that? And and he, I'll even cringe a little bit listening. Oh, he doesn't know. Oh. And it's like, oh, he's admitting that he doesn't know in front of millions of people. That's I, I find that very in, inspiring, just as you're saying. And 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 also, as you said, liberating because you're not keeping up this whole front of of knowing all this stuff. And, and there's an Epictetus quote. He says, you know, one cannot learn that which they think they already know. You also can't learn what you pretend to know yeah, because no true. one is going to teach you because they think you've already got it. That's a great point. Well, I'm going to give you some consolation, which is that you are not humiliating yourself with, in front of millions of listeners when you just talked about how much you talked at that lunch. You, <laughs> it's only tens of thousands. So, you know, it's not all so right. bad. You know, that's our, um, that's our, Law, if we're not careful, that we become yeah. egotistical about our humility. So here sure. you and I are, to some extent, bragging about how humble we're if we're not careful. And uh, any thoughts on that? Well, I think it, I think you're always wanting to look at the practical utility of it, right? So it's not, hey, you come off bad when you say, you know, when you talk. Uh, the whole meeting or whatever. To me, it's like, wait, I went to this meeting with this person I'm probably never going to meet again. And instead of learning anything, I sucked all the air out of the room that I don't want to do that in the future because it's depriving me of something. So it's, you know what I mean? It's lo- I, I think you want to make sure that it, humility is not great because of how it makes you look to other people. Humility is, uh, and, and I think Adam Smith talked about this so well in the theory of moral sentiments. And I think the Stoics talk about this a lot. Um, and I loved that you talked about it in your book. It's, it's like, these things are good for their own sake, that they are, that, there's a selfish reason to be good and to do the right thing and to be humble. It's because the alternative is, you know, hurting you in ways that you don't understand. It's making you feel pain that maybe you don't understand and, and deprive it's shutting doors that would otherwise be open if you were, if you were different. And so to me, that's the reason I think you want to think about these things. So it's, I, I hope it doesn't come off as bragging and more, comes off as sharing sort of tools or strategies. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I, I have to get in this quote from C.S. Lewis. Okay. Uh, just because it 
belongs in this episode, and I don't want to miss it. Um, he said, uh, humility isn't thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less. Yes. And I think that's um, – so it's it's not about uh, that you are constantly berating yourself for uh, your character, your, your flaws. It's that you're not the center of the universe. Yes. Um, I, I heard uh, Nassim Taleb once say, it's not – that God is great. It's that God is greater than you. Um, and I liked that. <laughs> it's uh, certainly, certainly true. Um, I'm going to shift gears. We got a few more minutes. We're, okay. we're getting close to out of time, but if you have another minute, I want to yeah. try something really different. Um, one of the things I thought about while I was reading your book is the role of ego in uh, nonprofits. It's a little bit of a different twist sure. on some of the lessons. So, one of the things I've noticed when I look at nonprofits is that they all struggle with it, – it's essentially an ego problem. That The people who run it uh, often forget what the mission is, mm-hmm. and they, I guess they start to think it's about themselves. I don't think they literally think it's about themselves. I don't think that's – but something happens. So instead of trying to cure the disease or help the, the, the poor or whatever it is, they start to make decisions to make the organization, say, bigger. Right. <laughs> but not any more effective and maybe less effective. So they'll get a donation to do, some, you know, typically earmarked for some purpose. It's really kind of tangential and distracts the leaders from the mission of the institution. And they take the money and I'm thinking, why are they taking that money? Right. It, that's not, that's not the goal. And they take it because it's makes them feel important to have a bigger organization. They want to stroke the ego of the person who gave the money. They, they convince themselves incorrectly that they'll get more money out of the person down the road maybe. I don't know. So I don't know if you've ever thought about that. I just find it fascinating to me how hard it is for nonprofits who often have a measurement issue, right, that, that it's very hard to often assess whether they're achieving their mission, uh, have trouble with that kind of um, – I think it's an ego problem. I, I, I absolutely do. I think it's, you know, it's the temptation that what your station or what you're working on says something about you as a person. Um, William McGaskill's book on effective altruism is a sort of a very objective look at these things. And I think you sort of always remembering that is good. There's some story I remember about George Soros. Maybe it's apocryphal, but he was, you know, this is what are we going to do with my money? This is my money. You know, he's saying this about a charitable donation. And someone said, you know, it's not yours. It's half the people's in the sense that, you know, it, just because you created a foundation, that would norm, that money would normally go to the government. And so it's reminding yourself, I think, that this is yours in trust. You don't actually own this. This is not yours. Like you are exploiting or you are taking advantage of a loophole that the people have given you. And I think you I think you want to th- I think maybe you think about it that way, that you're a servant of a cause rather than the head of an army or however, you know, an egotistical person might look at it. Yeah, but come full circle. Um, or earlier discussion of how yeah. you bring these lessons home. Given how frequent this challenge is for the nonprofits that I've looked at and, and come into contact with, uh, it, it must be hard for them to remember. You'd think it'd be easy, right? you think, oh, you're sure. working for this charity. It's a wonderful organization. They're trying to do this great thing. And yet you lose sight of your mission. You forget that you're really holding something in trust, whether it's uh, I don't find the tax money that exciting, but that's okay. Yeah. But I do find the cost exciting, and you can't keep that in mind somehow. Something goes wrong. Well, I guess it's a good reminder that if e- ego is manifesting itself even in the clergy and in nonprofits, what you know, you as a musician or you as a celebrity or you as a high-powered CEO, you better be uh, aware that it's going to affect what you do as well. Yeah. For sure. Well, any closing thoughts? Um, any no. closing advice on what people might take from your book? Is there, a sing- is there a lesson from the book we haven't mentioned that you want to highlight? I don't think so. Look, it's it's really been an honor to to, to talk to you. Um, I'm a huge fan of, of your work, so this is very cool. And, and Adam Smith uh, was a huge influence on, you know, there's a quote from him opening the, the first uh, book one, book two, and book three. And I guess 
if I could leave with anything, it would be to reference what I took the most from your book is, is that idea of the indifferent spectator that, you know, or impartial spectator, like, hey, I'm going to look, I'm going to use this, I'm going to create this external thing that allows me to see myself a bit more clearly and objectively and I'm gonna let that guide my behavior. So I don't, um, I don't do things that I would otherwise be ashamed of. My guest today has been Ryan Holiday. His book is Ego is the Enemy. Ryan, thanks for being part of Econ Talk. Thank you so much. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.